Hi everyone. In this Connect with Networking video, we're going to discuss Chapter 3, the physical layer of the network stack. Let's go ahead and get started. In the last chapter, we discussed the application model, which is at the top of the stack and is closest to the human being. We're going to move to the bottom of the stack for today's lecture and talk about the physical layer, which is how we design the physical architecture in our computers and our networking equipment that allows us to actually transmit networking signals from one device to another. In this chapter, we will have to differentiate between physical circuits and logical circuits. Physical circuits are the ways we are connecting our devices, and this could include wires or wireless transmission. Logical circuits are how we're using the physical circuits to achieve a particular goal. So it's possible we use multiple physical circuits as one big logical circuit. It's possible we use one physical circuit as multiple logical circuits. And we'll do our best to differentiate two as we discuss them. There are a couple ways that we can connect devices. One would be point to point, where we connect one device directly to another. An alternative would be multi-point, where multiple devices are connected using the same circuit. In most wired connections today, we use point to point, whereas wireless, we use the same frequencies for multiple devices simultaneously. Shared circuits tend to be less expensive, but they also have some downsides in terms of a shared resource. So when we can use point to point circuit, like wired networks, we do. When that's not possible, like a wireless network, we deal with shared circuits. Because we deal with point to point, we do potentially deal with lots of wires. And here's a picture of a particularly poorly managed networking location with all of the various cables that allow for point to point connections between various devices. And this is obviously not ideal. However, even in an ideal environment like this picture, you can see that the massive number of wires are necessary to connect each individual device in a point to point network. The advantage is that each device has its own dedicated pathway from itself to the next network device. But the downside is lots of cabling. And here's another picture of a well-organized network. But if you look at the top of the picture, you can see hundreds and hundreds of wires that have to flow through this infrastructure to make point-to-point -point work. Another thing we need to consider in our physical connection is how information is going to flow. Sometimes the only direction that information needs to flow is one direction. For instance, when you listen to the radio in your car, you're receiving a signal from the radio station, but you're never broadcasting anything from your vehicle. The best way of delivering that sort of information would be a simplex channel, where the information is only sent one direction and 100% of your bandwidth is dedicated to that broadcast. Sometimes we need information to flow in both directions, but we can get away with only sending information in one direction at one time. Think old school CB radio, where you have to push the button to say something and then say over and then let go of the button. And then the other side gets to push down a button and broadcast their message and say over and let go of the button. Only one side can be communicating at any moment in time. In some cases, we do need information to flow in both directions at the same time. This isn't actually ideal for most human communication, where we should be either listening or talking. But computers can be receiving information for one application while they're sending information for another application without any issue whatsoever. So full duplex allows us to send information in both directions at the same time. In some networks, we would dedicate more bandwidth for one direction versus another. Most home networks receive more information than they send, so they dedicate more bandwidth towards reception and less bandwidth towards broadcast. Sometimes we need to take a large high-speed circuit and divide it into several slower circuits to accommodate more devices. This happens commonly in wireless networks, where we have a specific set of frequencies that we can use, and we break them out into smaller frequency bands for individual devices. So you can see in this picture that anything between 0 and 2600 hertz is available to us. But we've decided to use 400 and 800 hertz for zeros and ones for one device and use 1000 and 1400 as zeros and ones for another device, 1600 and 2000 for a third device, and 2200 and 2600 for a fourth device. 
So all of our bandwidth is divided into four separate channels. This is a good example of a logical circuit not matching up exactly with the physical circuit. The physical circuit is everything between 0 and 2600 hertz, but the logical channels have been further subdivided. When we use frequency division multiplexing, like we see in this picture, we need to include additional guard bands or additional space in the frequencies so that we don't have collisions. It's entirely possible that the computer that's expecting zeros and ones as 400 hertz and 800 hertz might send a signal that's 900 hertz by accident. And we wouldn't want that to collide with the computer that's next to it using 900 hertz as its zero and 1300 as its one. So we add a little bit of extra padding or buffering between those two frequencies so that if there is some sort of error, we don't have collisions. What that does mean is that some of our bandwidth is used up by those guard bands. So there's some inefficiency here. As the equipment improves in terms of its technical capabilities, the guard bands can be narrower, but we can never really truly get rid of them completely. If you're dealing with light waves instead of electrical or radio waves, the way you would divide these signals would be wavelength division multiplexing. Instead of dividing different frequencies, you're dividing different light wavelengths or different colors. Dense wavelength division multiplexing can divide a circuit into more than 100 channels per fiber, and each one could transmit at 10 gigabits per second. So a single small fiber optic cable can broadcast a lot of data to lots of different devices. An alternative to frequency division multiplexing is time division multiplexing, where we would use the entire circuit for multiple devices, but instead of dividing it into separate frequencies, we give each device all of the frequency for some amount of time. Everybody has an equal turn. So imagine going around a classroom round robin where each student has a minute to present their material and then the next student gets their turn. In the computer world, these time divisions would be much smaller in the milliseconds or the nanoseconds. It is more efficient in some ways because it means that all of your frequency is being completely dedicated towards broadcasting information. There are no guard bands. But it does mean you might have some idle time slots. If you're giving a device time to talk and it doesn't have anything to actually communicate, that's wasted resource. A way of using time division multiplexing and trying to avoid wasted time slots is using a statistical model where as devices use the network more and more, we allocate more and more resources for them. If a device has been quiet for a long time, maybe we don't call on it as often, and so it doesn't get as many of the resources that are available. We could also program our network to give certain devices priorities. So maybe our servers get more priority than our clients, or maybe a particular set of clients gets more network usage than others. So there are lots of interesting things we can do, with statistical time division multiplexing, but it does mean that the network devices that we are using have to be more sophisticated, and that typically means they have to be more expensive. So more sophistication, more flexibility, more money. Sometimes instead of taking a broad channel and breaking it out into smaller subchannels, we want to do the reverse. We want to take some slow circuits and combine them into one high-speed circuit. T1 lines which is a service that phone companies provide, is doing a version of inverse multiplexing, where they're combining multiple channels to give a client and server more bandwidth. So this is the opposite of multiplexing, where we're taking multiple physical channels and treating them like one big channel. I always think of the Seinfeld episode where Kramer paints over one of the stripes in the highway to give people a really broad lane. It causes all kinds of traffic jams, but for the people who get to use that doubly wide lane, it's beautiful and comfortable and everybody loves it. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of media that we can use to transmit our data or, in some cases, our voice. If we are using a physical medium, a wire of some sort, we call that guided media. If we are using some sort of media that flows through the air, we're typically talking about wireless or radiated media. The most common type of guided media in a network environment is twisted pair cabling. And you can see a picture of a twisted pair down at the bottom. This is usually eight different cables that are 
twisted in pairs so that we have four pairs for eight total wires. And this allows us to broadcast information up to, in some cases, 10 gigabits per second. Often gigabit per second is a common speed. If we're worried about electromagnetic interference, there is a subtype of twisted pair called shielded twisted pair, which adds some additional shielding to the outside sheathing that wraps up the eight sub cables. But that's a little bit more expensive. The network that you have at home and the network that you see in your classrooms is typically category five or six twisted pair wire, operates very well at up to 100 meters in distance, and is used in most local area networks and some backbone networks. It's inexpensive and it works very well. Another type of guided media that you might be familiar with in your homes is coaxial cable. This is the media that the television company provides. So if you have a cable modem at home as your means of accessing the internet, you are using coax cable for part of your guided media into your cable modem. And then you're probably transitioning from that to twisted pair for the rest of your house. A coax cable has a thick copper core, which broadcasts most of the information. It has some outer foamy insulation, and then it has an additional second conductor which is often a foil or some sort of braided wire. And then the entire thing is wrapped in a rubber sheath. This is less prone to interference than twisted pair. It's a little harder to work with. If you've ever screwed one of these into the back of your television, you know that the cable is relatively stiff and difficult to manipulate. It's not very expensive, though a little bit more expensive than twisted pair. Because of how thick the cabling is, it can broadcast almost two kilometers. And it is very popular, like I said, with cable TV and as a consequence with many internet service providers. If speed is of the essence, the best media is fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cable is made out of glass. At the low end, it can be plastic, but that would typically be for the blinky Christmas trees you see during the holiday season. Glass fiber optic cables can broadcast information across great distances at very high data rates. Typically we're using lasers or very bright LEDs to send signals through these very, very fine strands of glass. Sometimes they are finer than a human hair. These cables can be very expensive. Depending on how well designed they are, they can broadcast anywhere from 500 meters up to 100 kilometers. And they are typically reserved for things like backbone stretches across large portions of a country or undersea cabling. Like I said, it depends on how well you've designed your fiber optic, how far you can send a signal. Original fiber optic cabling allowed the light to bounce kind of randomly inside the cabling. And as a consequence, it wouldn't go very far before it lost its power. The next version was a graded multi-mode where you could shape the light so it would flow in this very smooth curve and it could actually get a lot farther before it lost its power. The most expensive and fanciest version of fiber optic cabling is single mode, where we shoot a laser straight down the middle of a fiber optic cable and the cable is exactly the right width to allow that wavelength to move down that cable across very vast distances without losing any of its power. Fiber optic cabling is actually very resistant to the environment. This is a picture from something that happened here on campus a few years ago. We used to run a lot of our network cabling inside our steam tunnels. We don't anymore. A few years ago, one of our steam tunnels had a rupture in a steam pipe and the temperature reached 1500 degrees. So this is a picture of what happened to the cabling inside that steam tunnel. But what I think is so fascinating about this picture is this is actually a picture of a fully operational fiber optic network. Even though it looks like it's a mess, the fiber optic cabling wasn't affected by the steam and the heat. So the glass wiring that was wrapped with all this goopy plastic kept working without any issue whatsoever. The sheathing itself obviously melted off and eventually they had to go in and cut all of this out and replace it with more fiber optic cabling but the original cabling itself operated without interruption, even though it was exposed to very extreme conditions. This is one of my favorite pictures in this class. An alternative to guided media would be wireless media, and typically this is some sort of radio signal. 
Radio signals can be of all sorts of frequencies, and as a consequence, we can be talking about all sorts of different distances. So the frequency and the power will affect how we can use various wireless media. If we're trying to transmit something across greater distances, we typically are talking about microwave. This is a high frequency radio communication that requires line of sight. So when you see large radio towers next to the highway or inside your neighborhood, they are trying to get up above the normal sight line so that they can broadcast their signal to another tower up to 50 miles away. We use microwave towers in places where physical guided media cable is impractical or too expensive. So especially in environments like island communities or very mountainous communities, a microwave tower is preferable to laying or stringing cabling between poles. Another alternative would be using satellite, which is a very special form of microwave communication. Satellite is perfect for simplex communications where you're only receiving but not sending. The issue with two-way communication is because the satellites are so far away from the surface of the Earth, you actually do notice how long it takes for a signal to get from place to place. When considering what type of media you want to use for various situations, you need to consider a lot of different factors. Things like what sort of network you're operating. If it's a local area network, something like a satellite dish doesn't make any sense. However, if you're talking about a network that is spanning thousands of miles, using something like twisted pair is also probably impractical. So you need to consider what sort of network you're actually going to operate. You need to consider what sort of cost you're willing to bear. You need to think about how far you want to be able to broadcast your information. You want to think about convenience versus security. If you're particularly concerned about security, wireless or radiated media may not be an option. You have to think a little bit about your tolerance for error rates. Certain types of media have many more errors than others. Wireless media, for instance, often has lots of errors where guided media does not. Fiber optic is often the cleanest and the most secure, but of course, it's the most expensive. So there are lots of trade-offs and there are lots of reasons to consider one media versus another in particular environments. Let's take a short break here. I'll come back and provide the video for the second half of this chapter in just a moment. Thanks so much for watching.